Okay, here we go with part two. Um, so let's just pick back right up where we left off. So the big first question we want to accomplish in this video is why does Jerusalem matter so much for the three major monotheistic religions on earth, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? And then we want to think about the last video, we were talking a lot about what contributed to the growth of Zionism. Well, in this video, we're going to talk about what is contributing to Arab nationalism, right? And what World War I has to do with this as well, right? Uh, so let's, without further ado, get to it, right? So why Jerusalem, right? Without going on and on and on. Um, this is seen as the Holy Land for Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, right? Let's work in chronological order, so we won't go in the same order as this, right? Let's start with why it's important for Jewish people. This wall right here is the Wailing Wall, right? When the Romans destroyed uh, the second temple built in Jerusalem by the Jews, one wall remained, and this is it, right? So this is a very, very popular praying location in Jerusalem, right? Uh, if you are Jewish and you are visiting Israel, right? At least I am not. I am secular, but uh, from friends of mine who have traveled to Israel for religious reasons, they argue that when they are in front of the Wailing Wall, this is the closest they've ever felt to God before in their lives, right? Um, so this is the holiest city uh, if you are Jewish, right? If you're a Christian, right, of course, first off, uh, Christians use, right, the Old Testament is essentially the Torah, right? Um, so it's important for that reason, but it's also important because Christians believe that this is where Christ was resurrected after his death, right? So this is a very important location for Christians as well, also seen as the holiest city for Christianity, right? And then lastly, it's important for Islam because this is where um, Muslims believe that Muhammad rose to heaven, right? Um, and you can actually see these lo the, the most important location for Muslims here, the Dome of the Rock or the Temple Mount, right? So look how close they are together. This might give you a better sense of why Jerusalem is such a contested city to this day. Excuse me, I just have to cough for a second. You might want to mute. <clears throat> awesome. Okay, so uh, we're not going to do this activity again, but I just think it's really fascinating if you go on this slide on your own, number 41, and just look at what's happening to the Ottoman Empire. Watch it grow over time and then watch it shrink precipitously leading up to World War I, right? Consider what this is going to mean for this area in particular, right? When the Ottomans get sick, so to speak, and then die off, what new nations will be created, right? And in fact, we're almost there. Let's just watch what happens. So already, you are, okay, there we go, right? You're seeing, I'm just going to sort of let it happen. Here we are, 1875. So the Ottomans are shrinking away from Western Europe. Here they are right around the eve of the First World War, okay? They've collapsed. World War I is over. Here's the British and French mandate system. Here we are in the Cold War, right? And then here we are roughly today, right? Okay, so that's really important for us to consider, right? Basically, what does that mean? When the Ottoman Empire collapses, then what's going to happen in the Middle East specifically, right? So actually, I sort of, I want to look at the mandate system and the Sykes-Picot agreement, but I kind of want to go out of order because I want to be chronological here, right? So let's start with the McMahon Hussein correspondence uh, from 1915 to 1916, right? So historical context, we're in the middle of World War I here, right? The U.S. actually hasn't entered yet, but that's sort of a non sequitur. What really matters here is that Arab nationalism has been growing for a long period of time, right? Because of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, many Arabs throughout the former Ottoman Empire desire a state of their own, not unlike the nationalism that we discussed in Europe in the previous video. The other thing that the Arabs have in common with the Allies in World War I is a common enemy. We just said it, the Ottomans, right? So what this correspondence is doing is it's really a communication between a major British leader and a major Arab leader and what McMahon on the British side is saying is that we support an, 
uh, we support independent Arab states in the Middle East, more or less, right? But it's important that they say support and not promise. Why would this exchange be made? Largely, it's because the British want to depend on Arab military assistance against the Ottomans, right? And in exchange, they will help the Middle East develop into a series of independent nation states. But how that will happen is not articulated in these letters back and forth. The next year, fast forward into the Sykes-Picot Agreement. This may give us a little hint as to what the true intent from the British perspective was. Okay, so World War I is almost over by 1960. Not too long. Treaty of Versailles is coming in 1918, right? So at this point already, the Ottoman Empire is on the edge of, on the verge of collapse. And so this is actually a discussion between Britain, France, and Russia about what to do <clears throat> with these areas in the former Ottoman Empire, right? Now I'm going to go back to that slide we were looking at previously, this one. Okay, so the agreement was between Britain, France, and Russia, right? What they wanted to do was to create these so-called mandates of these newly independent nation states in the Middle East. Those mandates were Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, which is Jordan, and Palestine, right? The ones in green were British mandates. The ones in orange were French mandates. What is a mandate, you might ask? A mandate is sort of a fancy word for a colony in some opinions but it's a little bit more complex than that. I like to see it as an interesting example, actually, of neocolonialism, but we don't call it that most of the time, right? Because what the French and the British really wanted with these mandates was to have access to the very important resources in this part of the world, right? But what they didn't really want to do was call them colonies, right? Because imperialism was one of the causes of World War I, right? And the other thing that's happening is that despite the... Uh, sort of language supporting self-determination of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points at the end of World War I, some of the other allied nations aren't too sure whether or not they're ready to grant independence to their former colonies. So decolonization is a while off yet, but imperialism is no longer really uh, acceptable, right? At least theoretically. So mandate, in a way, could be seen as sort of a euphemism for colony, right? But what's important for us to realize is that after World War I, most of these states virtually become independent. They're just sort of babysat, for lack of a better word, by their colonial mandates. But Palestine is a different story. And one of the reasons why Palestine is different is because Palestine is not nearly as stable as these other nation states. So the British have more control over Palestine, or at least they want to have more control over Palestine, than the other mandates, right? As we will discuss moving forward, uh, the British mandate doesn't go particularly well. And that will be sort of the focus of probably the next video, right? And then the last promise, and I actually want to go back to these docs here, and I shouldn't say the word promise, the last exchange that we looked at was the Balfour Declaration, right? And here it is in its entirety, with the exception of the signature, right? So short, I can read it. His Majesty's government, the British, view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So more or less what this is saying is we, the British, support the Jewish people in their quest to establish their own state in Palestine. But, <clears throat> excuse me, even though this has been interpreted by many as a promise, it does not use the word promise in its language, nor, I might add, does the McMahon-Hussein correspondence. But this has been interpreted from the opposite perspective, right? To be a promise on both sides, right? Arabs interpret this to be a loose promise to protect or at least recognize an independent Arab nation, right? Or a series of independent Arab nations from the Turks, right? And then this exchange roughly two years later, right, was interpreted as a promise to protect a Jewish state in the region, right? So what we're going to see happen throughout the British mandate in Palestine is this sort of thought that these promises were broken, right? And again, you can just pause and look at this slide if you'd like, but this is giving us another sense of uh, you know, why there's so many problems taking place in the British mandate, but we'll get to much more detail about that. 
And hopefully you understand why Arab nationalism is also growing during World War um, World War One and actually World War Two. Although I think that's a typo, right? And a lot of that is going to contribute to increasing resentment and tension between Arab Arabs and Jews living in the British Mandate of Palestine. Okay, I think we have time to just briefly talk about some of that tension, and then we'll pick up with video three, uh, starting after Israeli independence in 1948. Okay, cool. So, like I was saying, right, there's a lot of tension in the British Mandate between Arabs and Jews, right? As time goes, goes on, especially as anti-Semitism continues, right, there's going to be more Jewish immigrants into the British Mandate, right? And this immigration also is sort of... Uh, seen as an increased answer to the growth of anti-Semitism and literally the growth of the Holocaust itself in the mid to late 1930s in Central Europe, right? So we did not talk as thoroughly about the 1929 riots, but it's important to know that they happened, right? What you see in both of these examples, right? Uh, these riots initially start from the Arab perspective, right? And actually they're just as much about Arab resentment toward the British, if not more so than they are about Arab resentment towards the Jews, at least at first. So let's really zero in on this revolt, right? This one was a little bit more Arab against Jewish people more specifically, right? Um, so, but let's talk about this one because this one is much bigger and this one is much longer. And this one has a really important result, the white paper. Okay, so this, if you can understand what these bullet points say, say you're good. This one, let's get a little bit deeper, right? So again, think about historical context. In the mid to late 1930s, Hitler is Chancellor of Europe. The Holocaust is well underway before World War II even starts, right? The British mandate is not really working so well, particularly because the population in the British mandate is increasing overall. And the ratio of Jews to Arabs is changing, right? There are more Jews migrating to the British mandate, right? The Arab population is increasing more by just natural increase, right? Just by the birth rates, right? So as these populations grow, there will be more tension, particularly in urban areas where these populations often live together. So these black dots you see on the map are cities that are mixed or towns that are mixed. There are Jews and Arabs living together. The orange dots are showing you Palestinian towns and some Palestinian rural villages. Palestinians tended to live in the more rural areas of the British Mandate and Jews tended to live in the more urban areas, right? So what you're gonna see in particular, like I said, in the cities, right, is violence, right? But the Arab result, re revolts rather of the mid to late 1930s was also about Arab opposition to the British presence there, right? And so many of these uh, revolts actually were met by violence. The British military very violently put them down, right? They actually uh, went after the leaders of these Arab revolts specifically. They did things called targeted killings, right? They went specifically after the figureheads of the revolt to try to stop the violence, right? But of course, many innocent civilians were killed, right? Both Jews and Arabs. By the time this three-year revolt ended, here's the rough body count, right? Despite the fact that the British stopped this revolt militarily, they want to ensure that it never happens again. So what they do is they sort of change their policy and they issue a document called the White Paper of 1939. And what that does is this, right? Two major things. So first, what the British do is they say, we're going to sort of tighten control over Jewish immigration into the British Mandate of Palestine. They're not saying we're going to stop it all together, but they say they're going to control it. So that's interpreted, especially among Jews, to mean we're going to restrict immigration. And think about the timing here. It's 1939. World War II is starting. If you're Jewish, the timing could not be worse, right? The other part of the white paper is that the British say that they're going to figure out some sort of independent Jewish and Palestinian state arrangement over the next 10 years. But you and I know what's going to happen over the next 10 years and how difficult that plan is actually going to be, right? Here, this slide, we went over most of the other things. This is just a really good snapshot of all the reasons why both Arabs and Jews are so upset with the British by the time 
Israel becomes an independent state in 1948 once the mandate is surrendered and the British leave. I think I skipped a slide somewhere. Nope, we're good. Okay, so with that said, let's just briefly touch upon what leads to the Jewish Declaration of Independence, or rather the Israeli Declaration of Independence in 1948. So basically the question is, how do the British leave, right? And then what's going to be the upshot? We're not going to watch this, but you could watch it again on your own time. Okay, so not only is the white paper the answer to the Arab revolts of 1936 to 1939, the British also leave the job to a very new organization whose very job is to protect and maintain world peace. That organization is the UN. Talk about a really challenging first homework assignment for the UN, right? So here's what the UN tries to do, right? What the UN is attempting to do in Resolution 181 is to carve out a Jewish and Palestinian state, right? What they try to do is to carve out a state that essentially minimizes the amount of movement that would be necessary for both respective peoples. And what I mean by that, if you take a look at this map, what you're seeing in this green on this side, this is before the partition, is where most of the Jewish settlers lived. What you're seeing on the, and of course in yellow, it's where most of the Palestinians live, okay? We also uh, saw that in that previous map. So you can sort of compare if you wanted to, right? So the partition plan was attempting to be pragmatic in that sense. Uh, the other thing that the partition plan did was it carved out a little bit more than half the land as a future Jewish state, right? And then a little bit less than half that land as a Palestinian state, right? Now, this was not very well received by the Arabs. And one of the reasons why that was, was because the Arab population was about twice as big as the Jewish population at the time of the partition. But the UN had a good reason for doing this. They said that they were anticipating more Jewish immigration into the British mandate, right? Or what, would, what was eventually going to become Israel, right? Sorry that I'm being picky about the language. I hope you guys understand why. But ultimately... Right, this was sort of seen as a huge insult to the Arabs, right? Um, the other thing that was seen as an insult to the Arabs was that the UN Special Committee on Palestine was uh, did not have any Arab nations actually in the committee. So they felt like they didn't really have a say in arranging this partition. So when it came to the vote, um, it was passed, the resolution, so the partition plan moved forward. Oh, the other part that I neglected to say was that in this plan, Jerusalem was to be an international city so that all people could have access to it, right? Back to the part, back to the vote itself, though. Um, Arab nations rejected the partition, right? But most Jews accepted it, okay? So that's where we are after the UN resolution passes. We're not quite at the independence of Israel but I think that this is a good place to stop for now. So we'll pick up with video three, which is going to talk about what happens as the British leave the mandate in 1948. So stay tuned for that. And thanks.